everybody, my name is Adam Pick, and I'd like to welcome you to the webinar titled Advantages of the Ross Procedure. If I have yet to meet you, I am actually a Ross Procedure patient who started heartvalvesurgery.com all the way back in 2006. The mission of our website is real simple. We want to educate and empower patients just like you. And this webinar, which has had patient registrations over 250 in number from people all over the world, was designed to support that mission. Now, during the webinar, you're going to be in what's called listen-only mode. But I would encourage you to submit your questions in the control panel that's probably in the upper right part of your screen. Now, let's take a look at the agenda here for the webinar. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speakers. We're gonna talk about aortic valve anatomy and disease. We're then gonna talk about uh, some of the more common treatment options. And then we're gonna really focus on this advanced technique for aortic valve replacement known as the Ross procedure. We're gonna have a Q&A. And then at the end of the webinar, I'm gonna ask you to just complete a really, really quick five question survey. So let's talk about some of the extraordinary physicians on the line. Dr. Paul Stelzer is a professor of cardiovascular surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, New York. He's also the co-director of the Heart Valve Center at Mount Sinai. And I have to tell you, when people mention the name Paul Stelzer to me, and I realize about all that he's accomplished with aortic valves, aortic aneurysms, and most importantly, the Ross procedure, I'll let you know that I actually call him a living legend when it comes to the Ross procedure. And the reason being is that he has now performed over 740 Ross procedures. I could be wrong, but I think he is the, the leading Ross procedure surgeon here in the United States. So it is an honor to have him on the call with us. Dr. El Hamamzi is a professor of cardiovascular surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, New York. He is the director of aortic surgery at Mount Sinai. And again, another aortic valve and aneurysm specialist. When it comes to the Ross procedure, we've got a living legend. And when it comes to Dr. El Hamamzi, he doesn't know this, but I actually call him the rock star of Ross procedures. He has gone on to train physicians all over this country, all over this world about this special procedure. So we've got a living legend and we've got a rock star on a webinar all about valve treatment. Could it get any better? Well, actually it can, because what I wanna show you is the result of the dedication and the hard work of these two men who are on the phone with us today. And it's not just them, it's their entire teams. But here you see Peter Waglum, Jeff Shabofsky, Elizabeth Boylan, uh, Janine Sullivan, Mark Croto. These are all people who are not just surviving, they are thriving. And it all is all because of the commitment to the Ross procedure, which all of these patients have had. So they are celebrated, and we, and in, per in particular me, I'm honored that Dr. Stelzer and Dr. El Hamamzi have taken time away from their very busy practice to be with us today. So to get things going here, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. El Hamamzi. Thank you so much, Adam, and thanks for this uh, wonderful and very generous introduction. It's, uh, and congratulations on all the work that you've been doing over the years. I think what you've done is really tremendous in terms of empowering patients and educating patients and really helping them navigate all these very difficult decisions that they have to go through. Um, what you didn't mention is, you know, Paul is definitely a living legend and I am the luckiest surgeon out there because I have the opportunity to work with him on a daily basis. I joined Sinai just about nine months ago and, uh, and it's been a true privilege to witness him every day uh, interacting with patients and do surgery. He's really a masterful surgeon and a and an incredible doctor. Um, so what we will try to do together today is really uh, walk you through what aortic valve disease is and what the different options for treating aortic valve disease are, um, but with a specific focus on the Ross procedure. So we won't spend too much time discussing the alternatives, 
but really delving into the uh, specifics of why we believe the ROS um, is, a, is a very appropriate uh, procedure for young and middle-aged adults. So as you all know, the or you may know, the aortic valve, the heart basically is a pump. And every time your heart beats, the pump, the muscle just contracts and the, the, it squeezes and it pushes the blood out of the heart into a big vessel called the aorta, which you see here on your screen. And between the, the, the pumping chamber of the heart, which we call the left ventricle, and the aorta lies this little valve which opens and shuts with every heartbeat over 100,000 times every single day. And the function of the aortic valve in simplistic terms is really to open fully to allow the blood to exit without any obstruction and then to close to prevent the blood from falling back into the heart. So it really uh, ensures that the blood flows in a single direction with every single heartbeat. But beyond just opening and closing, the aortic valve performs many sophisticated functions within what we call the aortic root, which contribute to the ventricle working as least hard as possible, and also ensuring that the flow of blood into the coronary arteries, which are the arteries that feed the heart muscle, is very seamless, both at rest and with exercise. So it really is a, a phenomenal piece of, of architecture, of creation of nature um, um, that is in that position. And as I said, a normal aortic valve, next slide please, uh, Adam, if we look at it from the top, um, looks exactly like this. Uh, next, it has one, two, and three uh, little, what we call cusps or leaflets. Uh, that's a normal valve. That's why we call it a tricuspid aortic valve. Um, and the, in about one to 2% of the population, instead of having three little cusps on the aortic valve, because a normal aortic valve, such as you see here, is able to perform its functions for almost 70 to 80 years before it starts showing any signs of fatigue or any signs of calcification on these cusps. But if we look at the next slide, you'll see a condition called bicuspid aortic valve disease, which affects about one to 2% of the population. It is the most frequent inborn anomaly in the heart. And instead of having these three little cusps, if you click, Adam, you'll see that you have two leaflets instead of the three. That's why we call it a bicuspid instead of a tricuspid aortic valve. And the issue with bicuspid aortic valves is that unfortunately they are not as performant in the long term as tricuspid aortic valves are. They tend to wear out a little bit sooner. And typically patients will present in their 30s, 40s, or 50s with a valve that is not functioning normally. And there are two ways that a aortic valve can malfunction. If we look at the next slide, you'll see the, um, apologies, this is, a, this is actually a surgical view of a bicuspid aortic valve. You can see where you see those two traction sutures on the left and the right hand of the screen is the edges of each of these, uh, 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 the bicuspid uh, aortic valve. Next slide. So what is aortic valve disease? Well, you can have one of two things. As I mentioned earlier, the main function of the aortic valve is to open fully and then to close perfectly and to seal perfectly well to prevent heart blood from seeping back into the heart. And so um, you can, in some circumstances, the bicuspid valve can, can uh, present in a way that it doesn't shut properly well. And in such instance, you have a leaky aortic valve. In other words, instead of touching with every diastole or every time the heart relaxes, the leaflets don't really touch each other. And there's blood that, as you can see on the right hand of the screen, um, the blood goes back into the left ventricle and the left ventricle eventually starts enlarging to accommodate this extra volume of blood. This, as you can imagine, creates a flow of blood that is not very efficient because the blood goes up and down uh, the aortic valve back and forth instead of flowing really in a single direction. And so with time, we'll discuss what symptoms can appear in these patients. So that's one form of aortic of bicuspid aortic valve disease or dysfunction. It typically presents at the younger end, uh, end of the spectrum in terms of age. So these patients will usually be in their 20s, 30s, or early 40s. Um, a leaky bicuspid aortic valve is typically a valve where we, do, we don't see necessarily too much calcium. And these valves can be repaired in uh, in, a, in a fair number of, um, of, uh, of situations. 
And then the other way that aortic valves can present with a, a form of disease is what we call aortic stenosis or a narrowed aortic valve. And again, if we go back to what the normal aortic valve does, which is simply open and shut with every heartbeat, um, in some circumstances, particularly with bicuspid aortic valves, around age 50 or so, we start seeing calcium deposits on the uh, aortic valve cusps, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. And that makes these leaflets very rigid and they don't open quite as well. So as the, the calcium deposit increase, the leaflets don't open quite as well. And as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, this is a surgical view of a calcified bicuspid aortic valve. And you can see that the forceps is pushed into the opening, but really forcing that opening uh, uh, to let that blood out. But really in a normal aortic valve, the full um, area of opening would be the full circle where the valve is sitting right there. So I always like to tell patients, aortic stenosis is very much like a water hose that you pinch and pinch and pinch more and more and more. You have a lot of pressure on one side and the flow is becomes weaker and weaker on the other side. Um, so these are the two main forms of aortic valve disease that patients can present with, mainly patients with bicuspid aortic valves are the ones that we're talking about today because, um, because that disease presentation presents at an earlier um, age in, uh, in life. Next slide. So one of the questions or two questions when you're a patient um, that you, will, you, know, you always want to ask is first, do I need surgery? And secondly, will be, you know, what kind of surgery do I need? And the first question is when should surgery be considered? There are mainly two things that we look at or that your cardiologist or primary physician will always be tracking. The first one is looking at symptoms and the symptoms of aortic valve disease are quite typical um, in that patients will either present with shortness of breath, uh, either at rest, but typically with exercise, especially in young patients. Um, sometimes they can complain of dizziness. Um, some may complain of chest pain. Uh, some may complain of just decreased stamina. You know, after a long day, they come home and they're completely wiped and very tired and they need to go straight to bed. Whereas, you know, a year or two before they would have been able to go for dinner or to do things after work. And then syncope or, you know, uh, uh, passing out is the the ultimate uh, uh, symptom associated with aortic valve disease and one that we fear a lot because um, uh, that can be indicative of very severe uh, form of aortic valve disease. And the second thing that we look at uh, and that we consider uh, in terms of whether a patient needs surgery or not is looking at the echocardiogram, the ultrasound that uh, your cardiologist or your physician will do with a specific look at the left ventricle or the pumping chamber of the heart. And there are two things that we look at there. One is, is the heart able to squeeze as hard as, it, as, a, as a normal heart does? And secondly, has the heart enlarged uh, beyond a certain dimension, uh, uh, at which point we would definitely consider uh, performing surgery? Because really anything that we do with regards to the aortic valve, we're doing to preserve the health of the ventricle, of the pumping, of the engine of the heart, which is the pumping chamber. And the valve is really there to make the ventricle's life easier. So anytime we see signs of distress at the level of the ventricle, we start um, having a more serious conversation um, with regards to surgical intervention with the patients. Next slide. Some of the common questions uh, that patients um, uh, ask are, you know, the first one and the very natural one, is there any effective medical therapy uh, if I have bicuspid aortic valve disease, whether it's a leaky valve or a, a narrow valve? And the reality is, unfortunately, there is to this day no effective medical treatment. All we can do is really just give medication to try to control blood pressure or to try to, you know, minima minimize uh, uh, fluid retention, but nothing that will impact how fast uh, uh, your aortic valve disease will progress or even to eliminate aortic valve disease from appearing. However, on the good uh, news is that there are very effective surgical treatments for um, aortic valve disease. And that's what we'll be discussing over the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Next slide. So these are the three main surgical options that patients have where anytime you will go see a surgeon 
with the aortic valve disease or an aortic valve that needs to be replaced. And I should mention um, that, again, as I uh, uh, alluded to earlier, when you have a leaky bicuspid aortic valve, that can be repaired in a fair number of cases, and that will always be our plan A, is to consider repairing a bicuspid aortic valve. And we have you know, ample experience here doing these procedures, but we really will focus in this case on the, in the situation where we have to replace the aortic valve. So a mechanical valve is uh, the first option. The second option is using an animal valve or something we call tissue valve or bioprosthesis. These are valves that are made either out of cow or pig material. And then the third option is doing uh, the Ross procedure, which will be the focus or the main focus of this presentation here. Now, each of these options have um, has advantages and drawbacks. There is no perfect solution for the treatment of aortic valve disease, but as you will see by the end of this webinar, there are different options which are best suited for a given patient. So we always try to tailor and indivi individualize the decision or the choices for patients in terms of what we think uh, best suits their lifestyle or their uh, uh, life expectancy, what they, they professional uh, uh, careers, et cetera, et cetera. So the first option is a mechanical valve. And these are valves that are made with, as you can see here, two little metal clips that will basically open and close every time the heart squeezes. So as long as the heart squeezes, the valve will continue to open. The main advantage of, of, a, of a mechanical valve is its durability. Um, although you may hear oftentimes that a mechanical valve is a one and done solution, the reality is that some patients do require a reintervention to re-replace a mechanical valve, whether because of infection or sometimes because of a bit of an inflammatory reaction um, beneath the valve, or sometimes there's a bit of a leak around the valve that can um, develop. But by and large, these are very durable options. The main issues with a mechanical aortic valve is twofold. The first, and, and really all hinges on the, on the, on the need to take blood thinners for the rest of the patient's life. The reason being that if you don't take any blood thinners and you have a mechanical valve in the aortic position, these mechanical valves tend to favor a clot formation on these little uh, claps that you see. And if you do have a clot that forms on the aortic valve, that can go up to the brain and cause a stroke. So patients need to be on lifelong blood thinning medication. And what that means is that if your blood is too thin, you have a risk of having a severe, a serious hemorrhage. If your blood is not thin enough, you have a risk of having a stroke. And when we look at populations of patients with mechanical aortic valves up to 20 years after surgery, looking at young adults, the risk of stroke or major bleeding is about 20% at 20 years. So about one in five patients will have something pretty major happen 20 years after surgery. So although it's a very durable option, this is something that always has to be um, kept in mind is that risk of, um, of a stroke or a major bleeding. And then the other little element that may in some patients cause a bit of disruption is the noise of the valve. You, in the majority of patients, you hear the ticking of the valve with every heartbeat. Most patients get used to that, but some patients actually complain. And I've had patients come back and ask for a, to have that valve removed and replaced just because they really couldn't bear the noise of the valve. On the upside, or in terms of new technologies, there's a new valve that you may have heard about called the Onyx valve um, that allows for lower INR targets. INR is really what we measure in terms of how thin your blood is. And we can aim for having slightly lower uh, thinning of the blood, which is associated with less bleeding in the long term. Uh, but still, it doesn't completely eliminate that risk of stroke or bleeding in the long term. And then the alternative to mechanical valves is putting biological valves, animal valve, cow valves. Um, and these have the, their main advantage is, is that they do not require any medication in the long term. There's no need for blood thinners. You can go about your normal life on a regular basis. But the main issue with biological valves is that the younger you are at the time of surgery, the faster these valves uh, wear out and need another intervention and another intervention. So depending on the age of the patient at the time of surgery, a biological valve may be very suitable, for example, someone in their 70s or even in their 60s, but patients in their 30s, 40s, or 50s, you know, if we put a biological valve in place, 
we are certain to go back for another intervention. Um, and that span of time between the implantation and the reintervention gets shorter and shorter as the patients get younger and younger. In a 30-year-old, a tissue valve, we would not expect it to last much more than 10 years. In a 50-year-old, we would expect it to last maybe around 12 to 15 years. Um, so frequent reoperations are in the offing for a young person who uh, undergoes a biological valve replacement. However, in, again, in looking forward and you know, in terms of where the technology and where the uh, uh, advances are, uh, the R&D is happening, um, TAVAR, which I'm sure all of you have heard of, uh, allows in some circumstances to implant a, a catheter valve through a biological valve that has worn out that needs replacement, which would then eliminate the need for a, you know, a surgical reintervention. But that has to be said with a lot of caution in the sense that if we look at the preliminary data of what we call valve-in-valve -valve technologies, the results are slightly sobering and particularly so in young adults where we ha don't have any knowledge about the durability of a TAVR valve and also in terms of the blood flow characteristics through the valves when we put a TAVR inside of a biological valve and we know we may need to do this on several occasions during a patient's lifetime, it's a bit like a Russian doll's principle where there's only so many of these that we can put before needing to do another open operation. So the third option then becomes the ROS procedure. And to talk to you about that, I will pass on the, the uh, virtual mic to, uh, uh, to my colleague, Paul, who will then who will explain to you all about the ROS procedure. Thanks very much, Ismail and Adam. Thank you for this opportunity. And this, this is an anatomical drawing by an artist that shows the, the close uh, association of these two valves that look very much alike. And Donald Ross discovered that when he was trying to find out something to use to replace a diseased aortic valve way back in the early 1960s. The first logical thing that they had was a cadaver aorta complete with its valve. And he put one of those in really early in the 60s. But he thought there might be something better. And he saw that guy sitting right next there, same size, doing about the same amount of work, the pulmonary valve, but taking it easy because the pressure over there is like 25 over 10 compared to 120 over 80 on the aortic side. So looking, living on the wild side, he decided to, to try to make that work by putting that in the position of the aortic valve. Now he put it on the inside of the aorta when he first put him in, although he did do a number of patients where that was just not gonna fit, so he replaced the entire root. And the aortic root is in, pictured here in that light pink color as a uh, first couple of uh, maybe centimeters, an inch and a half or so of the aorta, complete with the coronary arteries and the valve. That's really where the machinery is uh, at this part of the aorta. So replacing that entire root with the pulmonary root is a little bit of a daunting uh, concept to even to experienced surgeons. So this was first done way back in 1966, uh, 67. So this is a long time. It's not a new thing. It's not experimental. It's been done for a long, long time. Uh, and I've had the privilege of doing them now since 1987. Uh, so it's, it's been a long journey. And as you might imagine, there's a lot of a lot of sewing to do. And, and this is something that you don't just take it out of the box. And as long as you put it in, it's going to work. You have to dismantle it from the right ventricle and move it over and sew it in in such a way that not only is now oriented in three dimensions, just like the cylinder that it was on the other side of the heart, but it also has to have all those little needle holes stop bleeding uh, by the time you're done and put the coronary arteries back where they belong. So it's a much more complicated kind of thing. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Let, let's go to the next slide, Adam. It, so what, what's the concept? Why is this so special? Well, it's special just kind of looking at that picture. You, you get the idea because it's your own valve. We call that autologous. It, your own valve, and it has the advantage of being uh, just like the aortic one. It's, it's a mirror image one. Uh, this is this is not uh, made in a factory. <laughs> this is one of those gifts from heaven kind of things. They they come that lasts for 80 years or more in the vast majority of people. It's amazing technology. 
we aren't there yet with the artificial stuff by any means. And the living valve, one of the things that uh, Ismail's a little too humble to tell you about, he's not just an MD, he's a PhD as well. And that doctoral thesis that got him that degree, the title of the thesis he wrote was the living aortic valve. So he knows about as much about why that's special as anybody in the world. Next slide, please. And this is a picture of what the pulmonary valve looks like. It looks kind of just like the aortic valve. This is upside down. We're looking at the inflow end. Uh, and you see the three leaflets nestled in there with a little bit of muscle around the edges. And we just flip that over and put that in the uh, aortic position. And it'll do just exactly what the aortic valve does. Uh, the difference is that uh, because it's alive and it's going to be submitted to much higher pressures, it's actually going to change. It's going to make itself thicker, stronger, more elastic. Its cells are going to line up in straight lines instead of just all over the place, and they're going to start making some proteins they never made before because it's got a different job to do. That's what living things do. They can adapt. Nothing else we put in there can do that. Next slide. So what's what's why go to all that trouble? Uh, well, there's got to be something good to come from this. And what's been shown in a number of studies way back when, almost 20 years ago, long-term survival benefit was virtually the same as what people had without anything wrong with them, like matching the normal population. That's pretty amazing. Well, the Ross is the only thing that can do that, uh, that gets close to that. Others can come close, and we'll show you a few, couple of slides in a minute about how they do, but that's why it's, it's worth going to a lot of trouble. It is more trouble for us to do, but we think you folks are worth it that need this sort of thing done. Why is that? Uh, better blood flow. I mean, the, as Ismail said, the purpose of the valve isn't to, to see how little blood you can get through the hole or how much work the heart has to do to get it there. You want it to go through it as smoothly as possible without all that extra pressure work or having to do the work over because it came floating back in because the valve didn't close properly. So we call that hemodynamics, blood flow uh, characteristics. So that this has the best blood flow than anything. Because, you know, that's, that's the way God made it in the first place. And it's, it's pretty hard to beat that one. Uh, and the other thing is that the complications that come from using this technique are extremely rare. Uh, in the long term, this kind of valve is much more resistant to infection again because living things are that way. Uh, it is resistant to forming clots uh, because those cells in the lining of these leaflets re repel that sort of thing. And therefore, the, the, the chances of having a stroke are extremely low. Next. Now, this is to talk about the long term survival. This is a picture that I like to show people. It comes from Canada. Uh, it's, a, it's about 13 years old now, but it, it has the advantage of looking at both, uh, micro, both uh, well, tissue and mechanical valves. They did look at mitral valves too, but this is the aortic one. And uh, it looks like everybody survived the operation. So they only looked at the survivors of the surgery and they watched them for almost 30 years. Now, there are only 10 people alive at that point, as you can see on the bottom of the slide, but at 20 years, there's still quite a few people of both tissue and mechanical valves. But the sobering truth comes out when you see the red line on there, only half of the patients are still alive. And even at 15 years, it's about 70%. So that's not normal survival. Let's, let's look at the next slide and see, well, what happens with the Ross alternative? You go to all that trouble. This also comes from Canada, but much more recent, published in 2017. And you can see that the, the top blue line that's kind of hard to see under there is what's called a matched general population, same gender, same age, matched with the patients. And then the jagged uh, gray line is the Ross population that they were studying. And the dashed uh, kind of reddish orange lines, those are what we call confidence intervals or confidence limits. So if you think of something as two standard deviations within this or that, that's what 95% confidence limits are. So it's a statistical way of saying the chances are that these are really different if these confidence limits don't overlap with the other. So 
they proved out there by 20 years that you didn't quite match the general population. But then you have to always ask yourself when you read a study, are my patients or am I as a patient like the patients that were studied here? Five of those patients committed suicide. So you would <laughs> you might not have the same result as long as you don't do that. So let's let's uh, look for uh, cheerier outcomes and and uh, and not anticipate that to be the problem. That's not your valve's fault. And after you get to 20 years, there's not enough people to really look at them. You don't become immortal at 20 years uh, where the line turns straight. Now let's put those two together on the next slide. Now this is this is done to put them both on the same scale, the two studies, one with the tissue and the uh, uh, mechanical valves and the other with the Ross procedure. So now you see, well, there are actually four curves because there's the normal population at the top, and then there's the Ross, and then there's the tissue valve and the mechanical valve. And you have to ask yourself, okay, if I'm a surgeon, I wanna be able to give people the longest life and the best life I can. And that certainly looks like a better life than a longer life uh, if we can do this operation. And from the patient's standpoint, it's sort of which curve would you like us to put you on? And that, that often gets a duh kind of a comment that, you know, that I want to be on the best possible survival curve that I can. But uh, it's not as easy as it looks, as you probably could, can conclude it at this point. But that's, that's why you go to all this trouble. And this kind of, of normal or near normal life expectancy out to 20 years is something that's been proven on at least three continents in the last three years. So it's not like we're just telling you stories here. These are, these are real, real numbers. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, well, are there some concerns about this? It is a big operation, requires a lot of expertise. And, uh, and maybe I'll pass it back to Ismail to talk about what, what, how do we overcome those kind of difficulties? And, and obviously, uh, there, there's a possibility of reintervention in the future, just as you mentioned with the durability of the animal tissue valves. By 20 years, virtually all of them are going to need to be redone. And by 20 years with a mechanical valve, the number is actually at least 10% are going to need further surgery. So, Ismail, take it, take it away with talking about some of these things. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Paul. So next slide, uh, uh, Adam, and, and we'll finish here in five minutes and then take the questions. As I said, so the two elements that uh, Paul mentioned, technical complexity and durability. Technical complexity in anything in heart surgery, surgical volumes and expertise correlates really well with outcomes. And, and it, it does so very, very much with aortic root surgery. If you look, for example, at Dr. Stelzer's experience with the Ross, um, next. So you see, Dr. Stelzer has done over 730 Ross cases right now, and his overall risk is less than 1%. In fact, if you look at the last 500 patients, the operative risk is less than 0.5%. So particularly safe results. And that uh, graph on the right side shows that the actually the complexity of the cases has increased over the years and yet the safety has actually improved over the years so there's definitely uh, expertise and outcomes and if you look at my own results i've now performed over 500 ross procedures and the operative risk overall is also um, less than 0.5 percent with zero percent uh, mortality in the last 400 plus cases uh, that we have done so combined i think you know, we really demonstrate the notion that this operation can be performed very safely with equal outcomes to a regular aortic valve procedure. And then the second point about durability, if we move on to the next slide, is, is that with, when it comes to the ROS, technique really matters, not just for the safety of the operation, but really for the long-term durability and the um, uh, avoiding reintervention. These are pictures of Paul when he was younger with Donald Ross and Paul 20 years later with Donald Ross but really just to show you that this is, is an evolutionary tale and the operation has really evolved over the years. Um, Paul will tell you that he's not doing it today like he did 30 years ago um, because we have learned many things over the years. So whatever we used to do in the 90s, we did differently in the 2000s and we're doing slightly differently today because we keep improving on all of that. 
And the good news for you out there is that there's not just Paul and myself doing ROSs. Next slide. We, the principles of the ROS have now become really clearly understood and we're now able to clearly articulate them. And as Adam mentioned earlier, there are now many, many groups around the world starting ROS programs with very clear um, uh, and dedicated aortic surgeons and using a proper technique that will ensure long-term durability of the operation. Next. And by doing all of that, your overall risk of reintervention, particularly in patients with aortic stenosis, is around 10 to 20%, 20 years from the time of surgery. In other words, you have eight to nine in 10 chances that you will not need another surgery 20 years down the line, which I think is pretty significant. Um, but again, all hinges on the technique. So I think, Adam, this really uh, uh, completes the just the quick overview. These are some of the things that you will hear sometimes around the ROS. We call them myths because, you know, although some of them may be uh, based on some realities, maybe in the 90s or many years ago, today I think all of these are all these notions are a bit overstated. That it's a much riskier operation and recovery is longer. I think we've just shown you some of the results. Um, another thing you will often hear is uh, next is that it transformed a single valve disease into two valve disease. That's a very catchy phrase, but the reality is that what you're interested in is what is my survival like and my quality of life like. And this is really what we're interested in showing you as well. Next is um, and that this is not a durable operation. Again, as I mentioned, it really is intricately related to surgical technique. If you don't do a good ROS operation, yes, it will not be a durable operation. And you're probably better off just having a mechanical or a or a biological valve put in place. Um, you will also perhaps hear sometimes that I'm too old for the ROS procedure. Again, it really all depends um, what your biological age is, and that's really what we focus on, uh, Paul and myself, when we when we meet patients, rather than just a a number or you know a physiological number age. And then the last thing that you may hear is you know I've had a previous AVR or aortic valve replacement, and I was told that the ROS procedure was too risky now. And again, we can discuss that in more detail. So I think we have one last summary slide, which really summarizes our philosophy when we, or our, the goals when we approach patients with aortic valve replacement in young adults. One is we absolutely put as our top priority the safety of the patient. And we think that we can do a ROS as safely as a mechanical, as safely as a biological valve. We will never do something that is riskier for a patient. Um, and the second point, is looking at the long-term outcomes. And I think the younger the patient, the more important the focus on the long game is rather than simply the short game. And the long game is, sort of, you, what are the chances that you will still be alive, your quality of life, your exercise capacity, the risk of having a stroke, infection, hemorrhage, and obviously the durability of the operation. And for all of these things, we the evidence over the last 10 years or so overwhelmingly supports the notion that having a ROS procedure will favor these long-term outcomes versus a mechanical or even a biological valve in young adults. So again, Adam, um, thank you so much for having us today. Uh, you know, we, we could keep talking, as you can see, or I'm sure I see you nodding and thinking, geez, I hope they really finish because we've got so many questions to go through. But that's really the, the we could spend, uh, you know, a full evening talking about aortic valves and we won't get tired. So we'll stop right here and we'll, we'll let you do the, the, take it over from there. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Stelzer and Dr. El Hamamsi, I can't thank you enough for that overview. And um, I have to tell you, I've had the Ross procedure and I've never been so interested in it as I am right now. Uh, all, for all the reasons that you talk about, the, the quality of life and really the, the life expectancy, getting patients as close back to that normal life uh, expectancy given um, uh, the potential impact of valve disease on one's life. And so I have been going ahead and collecting as many questions as I can. I, I can't thank our community enough for sharing what's on your mind as you've been hearing this great information from Dr. Stelzer and Dr. El Hamamsi. And we're just going to get into it and go as long as we can. So Dr. Stelzer, Dr. El Hamamsi, are you ready for rapid fire Ross procedure questions? Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So here's the first one from Marcy. She asks, my daughter has bicuspid aortic valve disease with stenosis and is considering the ROS. We consulted two physicians who do the ROS. One doctor uses a Dacron sheath to reinforce the autograft. 
and the other uses the aorta. Can you tell me which technique is the medical standard for most doctors? And I threw in a picture here, uh, Dr. Stelzer, of, of uh, uh, an autograph that I think you worked on. Well, yeah, I've done a few this way, but the majority of them I have not done that way. Uh, this is <laughs> this is a technique that has been used uh, to kind of uh, I call it Davidizing the Ross, you know, where you put it inside a cylinder of of Dacron. That what that's going to do is it's going to prevent it from stretching. Uh, the the problems come with uh, picking the right size because the autograph isn't always the same size on the bottom as it is on the top. And that can pinch the bottom together too much and stretch the top too much or all, all those kind of things. So it's a, it's a really tricky thing. When I try to do them, I did maybe 10 of them, 15 that way. And, and I finally quit doing it and, and use other ways of supporting it to make sure it wouldn't stretch, but still give it some room to actually uh, give a little bit of ballooning of the sinuses, which is one of the ways that it, it helps coronary blood flow, uh, where that's that's a little bit harder to do in this situation. And you'll never end up with a uh, uh, hematoma, we call it, where you have a kind of the blood clot between that graft and the aorta. Now, the way this is drawn, it's drawn where it's not going to be locking things in. But some people do it where they sew the coronaries in, including that outer shell. So then you end up with it, we call it a dead space in between. But long story short, this works. It, it's, it's, we call it a jacketed Ross, fully jacketed Ross. And there are a number of surgeons that I know and respect that are making this work for them really well. Uh, I do it differently, Ismail does it differently. And is there's not just one way to do it right, but there's some concepts that particularly in patients who have aneurysms, of patients who have aortic regurgitation or mixed disease where the, dilat the dilatation potential has already been documented, you've got to do something or that's going to happen to the pulmonary autograft in that aortic position. Patients with pure aortic stenosis and a normal aorta, you probably don't need any of that. Uh, there are other ways of containing the autograft inside the native aorta, like Peter Skillington does down in, in uh, Australia, uh, or that uh, uh, Hans Sievers did in Lübeck, Germany, uh, doing it the original Donald Ross technique. So there are many ways to do it where there is support that keeps it from stretching and maintains its three-dimensional structure. That's what's important to make it work. Got it. Well, thanks so much for that, Dr. Stelzer. And let's move on to the next question, which is a really important one for patients. And I can remember trying to find um, the right surgeon for me. And Tim asks, um, how can I get statistics on surgeons about their outcomes for the Ross procedure? Who can I trust and we got another question that came in during the webinar. What are the types of questions I should ask my potential Ross procedure surgeon? Well, well, I, I think, you know, this is a trust kind of a proposition. And you, you know, people come into my office uh, every week and uh, something has to happen in about 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes an hour that make convinces them that, that it's, a reasonable proposition for them to put their life in my hands. And, you know, that's that's a big step, a big jump of faith. So a lot of them have done some internet research and there's a lot of good stuff on the internet. You can find out specific information about specific surgeons. Uh, and there's there's some in different websites that specifically talk about raw surgeons, uh, like the Cryolife website has. And that's, that's something that, uh, you know, nothing's perfect. And when it boils right down to it, you need to ask the surgeon, what is your experience? How many of these have you done? How many have you done in the last two, three, five years, whatever it might be? And, uh, and how have your patients done? Could I talk to one of your patients? Uh, that, that kind of thing uh, sometimes gives you a little bit of a, an insight into it, but it really boils down to, you know, if they've only done two or three, uh, then that kind of raises a little bit of a red flag because this is not an operation you can get really good at with the first two or three. Uh, how many would you say, Ismail, would it take to, to say you're competent and how many to become an expert? Well, we, we had done a study actually looking at the learning curve associated with the Ross, and we had determined that it's it's around 75 cases before you really get to a level of, of true expertise with the Ross, 75 to 100 cases. But I think 75 total cases is, is 
you know, it's a, it's a benchmark towards towards really having true expertise and and importantly, it's having a regular volume every year. You have to be doing this at least once once a month, if not more. Paul and I do, you know, about anywhere between sixty to eighty rosses a year. But you know, if you're doing fifteen to twenty rosses a year, that's a very good volume. So I think asking all these questions to your surgeon, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it is absolutely normal. You do it if you're buying a house or a car. This is your your heart. You should be asking all the questions. And you know, as surgeons, we're never uncomfortable answering these questions because we put ourselves in your in your situation, and that's exactly what we'd be doing. And uh, and so, just ask the questions and try to get you know all the answers you need. Yeah, it's perfectly said. And one thing for the patients out there, I remember writing down all the questions before I came in to see the surgeon for the reason that it can be uh, a little anxious and you might forget. So don't hesitate to write down and just go one by one to make sure you get your questions answered. Let's move on to uh, post-op restrictions regarding the ROS. And Derek asks, I have aortic stenosis and I'm 44. I do triathlons, marathons, and I'd like to skydive. What, if any, restrictions would I have after the ROS procedure? Well, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. I mean, the, the re part of the reason why we're so passionate about the ROS procedure is really the lifestyle and the quality of life element. And in all the studies that, where that has been studied, it has always you know, um, uh, performed really well because there really are no restrictions or no lifestyle modifications when you have a ROS procedure. Again, it's a living valve. It adapts really well. The only thing we're very careful with is controlling your blood pressure in the first six to 12 months after surgery to allow it to adapt. But really beyond that, you can go on to do anything. And I have patients that run marathons that have done uh, 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 triathlons and Ironman. Uh, Paul has uh, jet fighters and, and you know he has a whole uh, uh, army of patients who also um, have done exceptional, I mean, things that are really exceptional after their surgery. So really no limitations, if anything, that is one of the unique elements or aspects of the ROS. Great. And moving on to uh, aortic valve re-replacements. I think you talked about this a little bit earlier, but Mary asked, hi, Adam. My husband had an aortic valve replacement in 2016. He's 33 years old. If he needs another valve replacement, can he have a ROS procedure? Thanks for all the information. What, what are your thoughts there, guys? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, we, we, we do about 15% of our cases are redo uh, sternotomies. Uh, and the vast majority of patients have had procedures done on their aortic valve. Uh, I've, I've got at least 40 who had aortic valve replacements. Eight of them were mechanical valves, I should comment. And, uh, and a couple of them had homograft root replacements. So those are a real bear to dig out. So we, could, we can take most anything apart and, and uh, upgrade that to a ROS. But again, as Isabel pointed out, we're we're going for safety too. You know, we we kind of keep all we're, we're not going to do one trick pony things. You know, we we're going to go in there and make sure we've got a spectrum of plan A, plan B, and so forth, uh, to make sure that we can get this patient safely through this procedure and give them the best long term uh, prognosis that we can. So that's like the the marathon runner that I had. He was 54 when he came. He got short of breath when he was running, but that was after he'd done the bike ride and the swim. <laughs> and so his dream was to be in the Ironman Championship someday. He got his he got his wish when he was 68 years old, 14 years after his Ross. Now he's 80 years old. He got COVID, living in retirement in Florida. He managed to get through that, and he was back to riding his bike 100 miles a week when I talked to him a few weeks ago. So yeah, you can go a long time. He's never had anything done to either of those valves, I should add. Wow, and those those are the stories that we we love hearing here. And let's keep moving as uh, we go on here. Um, interesting question. Rhonda asks, my local surgeon stopped performing the ROS procedure for patients with VAV due to the genetic predisposition to form aneurysms. He said patients were forming aneurysms on the piece of the pulmonary artery that was transplanted in the aortic position. Is that a concern? Well, that's a, that's a good uh, question. And, and something that was a real concern, um, I would say, or you know, a topical issue about 20, 25 years ago, 
Um, we re there were concerns that patients with bicuspid aortic valves may have some genetic weakness in the wall of the pulmonary artery and therefore may tend to dilate after the ROS and require reinterventions. But the reality is that, the, as I said earlier, knowledge has evolved and we've, we've been following you know, hundreds of patients in cohorts and studies, and that has really not panned out to be quite true. And what it really is about is more surgical technique than a you know, genetic predisposition to dilatation or to stretching of the pulmonary autograph. Um, so no, you know, the, the, if you look at all the cohorts and the studies of looking at ROS patients, almost 80% of the patients have bicuspid aortic valves and some degree of aortic enlargement at the time of surgery. And very few of these patients actually require a reintervention because of stretching of the pulmonary artery um, in, in the long term, if the operation is done, again, following clear principles. And that goes back to the first question about the wrapping in, the, in that Dacron graft, which is one way that some surgeons have chosen to address the problem that both Paul and I think may not be the, the most suitable way to do it, just because the aortic, the autograft tooth is such a dynamic structure that to encase it in a very rigid Dacron tube eliminates some of the benefits of this operation, particularly when it comes to exercising and how the blood flows for people who want to do you know, skydiving or Ironman or marathons. So there are other ways that we can control that. But the notion to answer Rhonda's question of whether a bicuspid aortic valves is associated with weakness or predisposition, the answer is a, is a clear and definitive no in today's, with today's data. Great, thank you so much. Let's move on to Claire. She has a really interesting question. I hear it often. She asks, why is the Ross procedure not promoted here in the United Kingdom? Do you come across similar reservations in the USA? And I gotta say, I hear this from all the time from folks, but what are your thoughts on why you, a lot of patients have no idea what the Ross procedure is? I'll let Paul go first. I'll go, I'll go second for this one. Well, I, I think, um, you know, no surgeon likes to say that there's something he can't do or she can't do. And, and, and so they don't mention it if they don't happen to do it. And, and it's not that good surgeons all do it. There are a lot of good surgeons that just haven't had the experience uh, that Ismail and I have. We, we've really been very fortunate in our careers to be able to have patients come and more patients come and so forth. But, uh, you know, there are some really great surgeons out there that are 55 to 65 years old. That, that's not the time to start doing them. You aren't going to get enough experience. By the time you get good, you're going to be retired. Uh, and even though this was born in the UK, uh, and there are a lot of pediatric surgeons that do Rosses in the UK, or at least certainly enough to do uh, the, the kids that need it. Uh, the adult surgeons, uh, other than Sir Magda Yacoub, really never got into it. And, and I think part of that was a, a training kind of, a, what shall I say, perspective. You know, there was a very much an observational approach to teaching people when you say as well you you went through that system and and the american way is a little bit more hands-on and you know a little bit by bit you help people learn to do parts of an operation that are more complicated you know just say okay watch me here for five years and then go out there and try it that that doesn't doesn't fly it it doesn't work right? <laughs> so what you pick up on that is well say what your thoughts are why it's different yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think overall, I think Claire's question is a good point. I think there are reservations, and these are some of the things that we mentioned in the slides, and you will hear a lot of that. You know, what? Ha if you go back to the history of the Ross, what happened is in the 90s, there was true enthusiasm for the Ross, and a lot of surgeons started doing Ross procedure right, left, and center. And the reality is, what we now understand much better is that these are really specialized procedures, and only a handful of dedicated aortic surgeons with understanding of the anatomy, physiology, and all the principles should be doing. And so, you know, these are all typically young patients undergoing these operations where any bad or negative event is really so traumatic to everybody that it really leaves a, a big, big mark on, on cardiologists, surgeons, and the community in general. Um, and so following that experience and some bad events, I think there was, you know, loss of, of enthusiasm where a lot of people got a little, you know, away from the ROS because of that. What we're now seeing in the last 10 years is a real renaissance of the ROS based on 
all the evidence and the science, which we really didn't delve into in too much detail here, but there is a tsunami of evidence in the last 10 years to show these long-term benefits. And what is now being done in a very proper way is that aortic surgeons who have the expertise or at least the skills to be able to start ROS programs are doing so. And if you live in the UK, I'll be happy to tell you that there is a program that is just starting in Liverpool. The surgeons came to visit my program. They saw, you know, they spent a full week with me in, back when I was in Montreal observing and the whole team. And they're actually starting next. They were supposed to start in the summer. I was supposed to be there to help them, but COVID hit. But they're starting next uh, a month. There is a team in Bristol that is also starting. So there's definitely a conversation that's picking up in various centers in the UK and around the world as well. But in a much more, in a much more a thoughtful and a much more organized way that will ensure patient safety and good long-term results. Yeah, I, I like the way you characterized it as a renaissance. I, it almost feels like for me, who's been in the space now for 15 years or so, it feels like there's a reboot of interest. I've never seen so many in, uh, emails come to me asking questions about the Ross procedure. And it's great to hear that you're making this fully re reproducible by setting up these other facilities and institutes to carry on uh, all the great advantages of the Ross procedure. This is kind of one of my favorite questions, and I, I would love to hear an answer on this one. This could be our last question, but it comes in from Mike, and he says, I've heard Dr. Stelzer talk about the living tissue benefit from the Ross procedure on a video. Is it true that an implanted pulmonary valve in the aortic position actually enables the cells to talk to each other? Well, this is this is kind of what I was implying when uh, uh, talking about how living things adapt and how they start making proteins that they didn't make when they were in the pulmonary position. And it, they, they make substances that uh, are capable of communicating, shall we say, and for lack of a better way. Uh, for instance, nitric oxide is something that certain cells make and certain cells don't. What does nitric oxide do? It makes vessels dilate. So if you want to get more coronary blood flow, if you learn how to make nitric oxide, send a little down, you're sitting right there next to it. It makes sense that that might be set up that way. I don't know what that specific example is true, but, but that's an example of things that cells make to talk to other cells. So the body does work this way. Uh, it's not just every cell for himself. And uh, that may be true in prison, but it's not true in, in, the, in our body cells. Uh, Ismail, of course, knows all about the living aortic valve. That's what his PhD is all about. Take it away, Ismail. No, and I'll, I'll tell you just one thing to, to, to add to that. The, the, um, I once had the opportunity, a patient that had had a Ross at the age of 33 in the UK. I was, I was in the UK at the time. This is in 2008. And the patient was now in his 70s. He was 42 years after his Ross. Both valves were still functioning normally. And he unfortunately passed away. And the family called Professor Yacoub, who had done his surgery as one of the first Ross patients, uh, or his first Ross patients. And he asked them one thing, would it be possible to look at the valves under the microscope? And the family absolutely agreed. I mean, he was family to them and they really owed him so much. And so we took that valve and we looked at it under the microscope 42 years after the Ross procedure. And when we looked at it, the cells were still alive, the structure, the trilaminar structure that we see in a normal aortic valve was still present in that pulmonary valve in the aortic position. It was a really, it was one of these aha moments where you think, wow, this, all of these theoretical benefits actually do translate into, into reality, not just in terms of the viability of the valve in the long term, but also now, you know, knowing that that translates into clinical relevance in terms of, you know, the other things that we mentioned, survival and exercise capacity, et cetera, is really, it makes a complete story from the, you know, very early days where the Ross was, was invented because of a lack of alternatives to now making this comeback because of the, the impact in the long term. It really is quite the, the 50 year journey, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah, amazing to hear that from both of you about the living cells. And as I know, Dr. El Mamzi, you said you could talk about the Ross procedure for a long time. I know Dr. Stelzer, you could go on just as long about how important this procedure has been to you, your life and your patients. And we've gotten a lot of questions here today, but I think it's time as we come to the end of the hour that we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. 
uh, unfortunately. But what I'd like to extend to all the people in our community, uh, the folks on the line, the heart valve patients, everybody at heartvalvesurgery.com, a tremendous thank you. Getting together with you live in these community events are fantastic. Please don't uh, exit the webinar just yet because I'd like to have you on the line when we extend a huge thank you to Dr. Stelzer and Dr. El Hamamzi for their incredible work around this very unique, very advanced treatment for aortic valve disease. They are empowering patients and we are thrilled to have them on the line today. I know Dr. Stelzer, you mentioned um, uh, the CryoLife website. I just wanna make sure everybody knows there is a website out there called, I, I believe it's the Ross Procedure dot Org. If you can write that down, I think you could learn a lot of information. And the folks at CryoLife were, were very kind in, in giving us the opportunity to have some of their images shown today on the webinar. Lastly, what we're going to do is we are going to put up a quick survey. It's just five questions, but if you can take a few minutes to complete it, we would really appreciate it. And on that note, I want to extend another thank you to Dr. Stelz or another thank you to Dr. Hamamzi, everybody in the line. And as we approach that time of years, uh, I want to wish everybody a very happy, healthy, and safe holidays. Thanks so much. And as we always say here, keep on ticking, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Adam, and thanks for all you're doing.